They said the ancient city wasn't there, that it was a myth, that the ruins fabled to lie in the deserts of the Levant might be ancient, but there was no evidence that such an empire ever existed outside the imaginations of long-dead fabulists. But hearing that the French had secretly begun combing the old mounds looking for a lost metropolis, a British diplomat made the dangerous trip to the city of Mosul and began inquiries about digging at Atel, once examined by the French, now abandoned. Late one evening, the man, Austin Laird, made his way into the crevices of the tell where he wanted to dig. Surprising a, a family of poor Bedouins, he communicated with the husband in broken Turkish. To Austin's surprise, the man volunteered to bring additional workers to help dig. At the largest mound, daylight revealed broken pottery, scattered bricks, inscriptions of tightly packed wedge-shaped characters, cuneiform. The local workers saw what Laird was picking up and began collecting similar fragments, one of which was a chunk of an old bas-relief, a sculpture into ancient rock. This led them to a crumbling old vertical slab that turned out to be part of an ancient chamber wall. More workers were attracted by the news of good-paying dig work, and eventually the chamber was unearthed. On the floor, along with more inscriptions, were ivory figurines, a king holding an ankh, part of a crouching sphinx, and flowers adorned with fragments of gold leaf. The first artifacts to come out of the ruins of Nineveh. This is a third talk from the book of Jonah. Of course, the most famous part of this story is the, the fish or the sea monster that swallows Jonah and coughs or spits him back up on land. I'd invite you to stick around for the end where I'll share a few facts that blew my mind when I first came across them. I hope that you find them similarly exciting. The first chapter describes the disobedience of Jonah, boarding a boat to get away from God and God's mission for him. He was supposed to preach to the city of Nineveh. He had good reasons for not wanting to go to Nineveh. The Assyrians who lived there were the most feared, cruel conquerors of their day. Then God engulfs Jonah's ship with a storm. At the prophet's direction, the sailors throw him overboard, and when the storm stops, the pagan sailors, who otherwise had no knowledge of the Lord, Israel's God, turn to him in worship. <laughs> Jonah was trying to commit suicide. He'd rather die than do what God asked, despite his earlier success in God's service back home. But the fish prevents all that. And the second chapter of the book is a hymn to God from inside the fish. Jonah turns to God, which is good. It's enough for God to work with, to answer his prayer. He does end up back on land. But when you dig in, you notice that the prayer is very self-centered. Jonah never acknowledges his sin, and in his prayer, notes that worshippers of other gods have no hope at all, ignorant of the sailors turned towards the true God on the waves above. We get hung up on the fish. It's the famous part of the story, and a lot of people over the years have said it's impossible for a man to live through an experience like that. If you want to read this as an inspired, God-breathed parable, I'm okay with that. It makes it makes a certain amount of sense. But remember, miracles are okay within the Christian worldview. In fact, our faith depends on the historical fact of Jesus rising from the dead. So, given that there's so much under the ocean that we don't know about, given that uh, the people of the 1800s had dismissed the very existence of Nineveh, that is, um, educated people, only to be proven wrong, I, I think it's better not to bet against the Bible. The fish is not that important to the story, to the author of the book. It's only mentioned three times. It serves the purposes of God. I believe the fish was important to the people of the city, as we'll see, but the author didn't expect us to dwell on it. Chapter 3, starting with verse 1, we pick up the story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. As far as I know, this is the only time in the Bible where the word of the Lord comes a second time to the prophet. And there's great hope in this. 
God's mercy is never-ending. The second chance for Jonah should have been an opportunity to take stock of the many things he believed about God, and, and wrongly so. The message the Lord gave Jonah, though, isn't here in chapter 3. It's in chapter 1. And there we, we read, the message is, the city's wickedness has come up before the Lord. And wicked they were, skinning enemies alive, brutally killing all the people who lived in the cities they conquered. The Assyrians used to surround a city and take captured soldiers uh, and impale them in view of the walls so that those inside the city could see the faces of their men as they writhed to death on those poles. So this wickedness has risen up before the Lord, according to chapter 1, but the message Jonah gives is a little different, as we'll see. Verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Largest city in the world at that time, we now know. Uh, the original text says something like, it was a divinely large city of three days' journey. He gets one day into the city with what in Hebrew is a five-word sermon. A few more words in English. So, he says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. What's missing? How it will be overthrown? Who is behind the decree that it's going to be destroyed? Anything they might do to keep this from happening? I mean, he, he doesn't tell them that the Lord has given him this message, and he hasn't told them what specifically God asked him to, that their evil has come up before him. It's kind of like, sorry, not sorry, you guys are screwed. <laughs> but then, in verse 5, to Jonah's terrible shock, the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, uh, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. We don't fast much these days unless you're a health nut and are fasting for fitness reasons. In our culture, going without food really is not encouraged or expected. In ancient times, it was used as a spiritual practice, especially in times of crisis, and you can find believers who will do that now. It's just not as common. Well, back then, you could show how sorry you were for your sins by renouncing food for a while, um, even water on occasion for a much shorter time. So the, the whole city is fasting, including the animals, which seems a little strange. We'll get back to that. Sackcloth is like burlap made of animal hair, uh, potato sacks, Another way of demonstrating your seriousness as you repent. Not comfortable. Every move that you make in burlap reminds you that you're supposed to be telling God how sorry you are. Jonah never gets to City Hall based on the language. The king here is probably not the Assyrian emperor, but rather their equivalent of mayor. And uh, the mayor, in verse 7, issues this proclamation. By decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. So this is serious repentance, a serious fast, uh, eating or drinking. You can't do that for long without getting seriously ill. Uh, making the animals participate in this repentance is one of the comic aspects of this story, but it points to something important. Not everybody in Nineveh flayed or impaled people. The, the military might have, but not the grandmother selling vegetables at the market or the metal workers at their smithies. Not the kids. Not the animals. Animals don't understand what's going on, why there's not water or food in their troughs. So this sounds maybe a little dumb, uh, but the Assyrians, the Lord will later say to Jonah, aren't that bright. Even stupid people have a moral sense. Jonah never tells them why this judgment is about to visit their city, because they already know. 
This is the sort of thing Paul is talking about in the New Testament, Romans chapter 2, where he says that people who never had God's revelation do the things required by the law. They're a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law or the Torah. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. In some respects, our post-Christian culture resembles a pre-pagan culture. The people of past civilizations had firmly developed senses of right and wrong that they all agreed on. These days, you have a lot of folks who tell themselves that right or wrong are only up to the individual. You and I might be fine calling out someone else's wrongs, but if we hear that what we like to do might be a sin, we're tempted to scream bloody murder. Down deep, we know there's a right and wrong beyond what we as individuals want or desire. Dumb as they were, the Assyrians knew deep down that their reputation for evil was deserved. And even though most of the people of the city had not directly participated in war crimes, they were part of a nation that had. And they turned to God. Jonah hadn't given them full information. He doesn't use uh, God's personal name, the Lord, uh, the word that would help them recognize that it was the true God, the God of Israel, that was uh, directing the message. So they, the Bible uses this generic word for God in this passage. So they turn to, the God, turn to God in, in repentance. Actually, turning is repentance. That's what the Bible word means. Not just saying words, not just saying I'm sorry, but changing the direction that you're going. Jonah had not given them, them any hope that it would do any good, but somehow they, they took a shot at it. In verse 9 it says, this is still part of the, the mayor's proclamation or the king's proclamation, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And so the mayor has been given insight into the true character of God. This is something that Jonah knows, as we'll see. He is aware that God is compassionate and merciful and responds when people turn, responds when people turn towards him. But he doesn't tell them that because he doesn't want them to repent. So, clearly the Spirit is moving here and um, giving these guys insights that should have come from the prophet, but anyway, they are willing to, to repent and to see if it will work and, and save their city. Now, we hate the idea of God's anger. Um, so, you know, this verse here, verse 9, talks about his fierce anger. Um, many of us think that we have to choose between Bible verses like this and verses like, I've loved you with an everlasting love, and whoever believes in him will not perish or be lost, but have everlasting life. And I do prefer those latter verses myself. But maybe God's anger is an aspect of his love for us. Humans are, are really great at hurting each other. We can see that. We can see that it's bad. But even things that we do to ourselves that we don't think affect anyone else may mutilate the image of God that we're created with. And what the Bible describes as God's wrath is his reaction to things that hurt his children, whether they do it to themselves or do it to others. This world is rife with sin. That's what we have in common with Nineveh. That's why Jesus had to die. His act of dying for us on the cross is a, a sort of lightning rod to redirect the effects of sin away from the human race, away from us. That's why if we turn to him and believe him, he's able to rescue us from death. The people of Nineveh didn't know any of that. They heard Jonah's message of doom and took a chance on turning towards God. I should note here also that the messenger can give a very distorted message and still be used by God. I was reading in Luke 10 this week, came across a line where Jesus says, Whoever accepts you accepts me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. And I thought, wow, what if I get the message wrong? Doesn't that render this promise kind of ridiculous? I'm sure you've had the experience of cringing at things that are sometimes said in church. But Jonah, uh, his example shows us that uh, the Spirit of God can still speak through very distorted messages. These Assyrians in Nineveh, why were they so 
responses. <clears throat> so, the Assyrians. Why were they so responsive? Why was such a, a poorly constructed and limited and distorted sermon so well received? Well, clearly the Holy Spirit was moving in their hearts. And we see this in the, the words of the king where he says, well, maybe God will have mercy on us if we turn to him. But there's a little more, and um, it's not obvious to us from the text. I think that was because the, the Bible writer did not want to give any uh, page space to paganism. And I told you that God was 10 steps ahead of Jonah. He can see the end from the beginning, and while I don't think that God predetermines uh, when we go wrong, he can see far enough ahead to predict what we're going to do. So he knew ahead of time all the things that Jonah would do to try to get away from his mission. And the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. That's, that's what it says. The fish might be a small part of the Bible story. I emphasize that for a reason. But it was perhaps a lot bigger to the people of Nineveh. You see, the, the city of Nineveh, the name means place of the fish. And in Sumerian mythology, human beings were guided at the beginning of civilization by seven sages or demigods called Apkalu or Abgal. These divine beings came from the sea to provide wisdom to specific human beings, usually priests or kings. They're depicted in ancient carvings as beings that are both man and fish. Here comes a messenger into the city. He looks like a man, but he smells like an entire pod of dead whales. There's a report from the coast, perhaps, miles away, that he came out of the water. This being, who looks like a man and smells like a fish, has got a divine message. Jonah ran from God, but God used that horrible decision for disobedience to set Jonah up with more credibility to the Lord's audience than any other prophet in the Bible except Jesus himself. A fishy man who came out of the sea, he must be from the gods. You have to listen. And the city repents. Well, the mayor had enough revelation from the Holy Spirit to, to have his people turn towards God. And so verse 10 says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. That's all the Lord wants, that we turn towards him. In Jonah chapter 2, he turns towards the Lord inside the fish, even though he doesn't near, go nearly as far as the Ninevites do. The Ninevites go all the way. They acknowledge their sin as they're crying out to the Lord in repentance. God just desires that we turn towards him. That's all he wants. And it's when we do that that he is able to um, shift our, our sins onto Jesus, who died and rose again so that we could be right with God forever. And um, my prayer for you and me is that he would help us turn towards him day by day without having to traumatize some poor rebellious prophet in the process. God bless you. <laughs>